Thanks for joining us today. We got a great episode for you. Today, we're going to get into a discussion about weed and alcohol and should or shouldn't Christians partake. As you're listening, if you hear something that reaches you or if you have questions, check the show notes and you can see how you can get in contact with us or join the discussion. Welcome back to This Ain't Sunday Morning Podcast, where we talk about life after the benediction. My name is Courtney. I'm Tanisha. I'm Paige. I'm Antoine. We are the Young Adult Leadership Team of Westside NBC in St. Louis, Missouri, where our aim is to reach the city for God. Shout out to our senior pastor, Charles H.N. Bobo Sr. We affectionately call him PC. Check our show notes for service times. All right. Asking for a friend. So this is our segment where we kind of talk about those church-isms, the things that we do in church, but a new person may not even know what it means. And so for this episode, our church-ism of the day is Mondi services. Do y'all even know what that is? No, I do not. (laughs) Mondi. And so it comes like, so during Holy Week, that Thursday before Good Friday, it's called Mondi Thursday. Um, And that's where they had like, well, that was the Last Supper, right? And then, like, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples to prepare them for their ministry. And so, Mondi services are basically foot washing services. Uh, where <laughs> it's a no for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, the question was is it still a thing? How we feel about on page? We got your answer. <laughs> and were they ever necessary? And I guess the thing is, like, so when you think about why Jesus did it, mm-hmm. was because he, it was basically his way of humbling himself. So if he is God, the Savior of the world, all power, omnipotent, and he's getting down, washing the feet of his disciples, and can y'all imagine what their feet would look like? They had they just had <laughs> They didn't have sidewalks, right, paved right. roads yeah. like we do. They was walking on dirt and clay. Yeah. So Real can nasty. you imagine what their feet looked like? But he would get down and wash their feet. And so for us, it, it the ceremony, it symbolizes like humbling ourselves. And it's, a, it's an act of humility, but it's also an act of service because Jesus came to serve not to be served and so that's his way of sending us out and so i haven't seen them as often have y'all have ex- ever had an experience with one i have had an experience with one here at west side and i, I was telling y'all before i was extremely nervous because um <laughs> even though i had tennis shoes on my feet looked like the ones in uh olden bible, bible, uh, bible times with the <laughs> With the sandals, like I've been walking on rocks or sand and no, stuff no. like that. But I was like, I was embarrassed. I was like, uh, dear Lord, please <laughs> don't let them judge my feet. Dear Lord. <laughs> but it was a, I, honestly, it helped me become more humble because, you know, uh, Pastor Bobo and Ronald Bobo was out here washing people's feet. That kind of showed me his humility mm-hmm. and really showed me how to be more humble to Christ in order to be able to continue to be a light and to serve those. Um, not only in the church, in the church and outside the church. That's a real re- representation of what Christ is. Amen. I've only seen it once, like Courtney said. Um, I was a kid here at Westside when I saw it, so I really didn't understand um, what it meant. But now with you elaborating um, on it, I, I guess um, – if the church is more a traditional church, I guess that they will still do it. But if some a church is more modern, I don't see them really doing it or whatever because it's not like the it thing or the thing to do um, unless like a pastor is like preaching about it or whatever the case might be. But I don't really see um, churches doing it because feet, really? <laughs> Your feet nasty. Nah. If they brought it back, what you going to do? You gonna stand in the back. You have nah, to go I'm to the go, bathroom. Listen, I'm gonna go get me a pedicure first, and now I'll be like, yeah, you can touch my feet now. But are you washing feet though? That's the question. Listen, unless it's my husband, but I ain't married, so. But speaking of that though, somebody was talking about how like they did it as part of a wedding ceremony. So yeah, I, if it's my husband and I'm married to you and we about to be married for lifers, yeah, I got you, husband. But if it's just anybody else, nah, dog, get somebody else to do it, okay? <laughs> It is love. What if you had to wear gloves? Oh, if I had to wear gloves? Nah. Nah. <laughs> it ain't enough protection. 
That ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that I did participate in one, and I think it was either an epiphany worship or just another consecration service that we had here. But, I mean, it was a long time ago. Um, but I did wash somebody's feet. I don't even remember whose it was. But I will say it is definitely a humbling experience. And so to be able to do that, and even to make somebody else feel at ease and feel comforted mm -hmm. with that, I think it shows love. And right. at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do is to show love. Thanks. So are they still needed? I guess that's to be determined because Paige ain't doing it. No. <laughs> PC, don't get no ideas, but okay? I think <laughs> the message that it sends and the symbolism of it, I mean, if, if it was done, I think people would get value from it. Yeah. All, all jokes aside, I, I'm, I'm joking when I say this. If PC <laughs> actually were to do it, I think that I would be vulnerable and put my pride to the side and actually do it because the symbolism behind it or whatever. Um, you know, because like you said, that is like a, you, you're you being humbled and you're vulnerable or whatever to wash somebody's feet. Like, that ain't no arm or no head on your, you know what I'm saying? Like, somebody's feet. So if PC was to do it, I would not like him for a very long time. <laughs> but you would complain. But I would still do it because my pastor is doing it. You know what I'm saying? If my pastor do it, I'm going to do it. And, and that's the whole spirit of it, I think, is just humbling yeah, yourself. Absolutely. To, to share love. Amen. <laughs> well, that is Mondy Services. M-A-U-N-D-Y. Not Monday. Not Mondy. Monday or I should have thought somebody just spelled Monday wrong. <laughs> 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 Love it. All right. So today's topic, y'all, we are talking about weed and alcohol. Dun, 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 dun. So we know that like last year, like that's when all the big hub of like states were legalizing marijuana. And it was just a lot of conversations about opening up the recreational use of marijuana um, and then we know we've always had alcohol so like since prohibition you know was repealed you know alcohol has been legal in the United States and so today we just want to talk about if it's legal what does that mean for Christians mm -hmm. just because the law says it's okay does God say it's okay and we just want to throw the discussion out there get some thoughts so what were your thoughts if any, when they legalized weed? Uh, I would say mine was kind of like, like uh-oh, um, because I've, I've known some people like from my past who were basically doing it on um, rec recreational on a daily basis anyways. Like when we were in college, we did it every day, like literally every day, and just to just have fun with it for real. It was almost like a social thing. It wasn't act like I actually needed it. It was just something that we did. Um, but I've known people who are already doing it every day on a daily basis anyways, and I still know some of those people, but I don't really hang with them. Um, I kind of cut ties with them a while ago, but I've known their habits. So they still they still do it, and they made it more legal now where you can get it in different forms because um, <coughs> people were already doing it, using it in food and stuff like that. Uh, they were already doing this stuff before it became legal. And now that it's legal, it makes it more of a necessity almost. People just, just um, they make more use out of it. Like they can go to stores, which is there's a couple stores around, even around the church, that they call themselves um, cookies and stuff like that. So people be going to the store to get their supply. They don't really have to. They can even order it online. They have stuff on the app now that I've seen on YouTube where they just can subscribe to certain things. They can get gummies. A monthly time now so anything is 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 really in front of them they can just purchase it and get whatever they need they don't really have to really drive anywhere so that's the thing about technology now so that's kind of what my thoughts was like uh oh this gives people options and too many options wherever you're going if you're traveling to another city like in illinois this been legal in illinois mm -hmm. they have stores everywhere in chicago because we when we go to chicago i see stores everywhere um so i think it's somewhat um, it's a, it could be a, a dangerous thing if you're do it, doing it for a recreation because it gives more opportunities for younger people to have access to this new stuff. Those are my thoughts. Um, I think for me, I, I really didn't have any thoughts because like, it really didn't affect me that much. 
um, because I do not um, participate in smoking weed anymore. Um, so it, when it got legalized in Missouri, like my life kind of still stayed the same because it, it don't affect me and I don't hang around um, individuals anymore that partake in those um, activities. So it really didn't affect me. I'm just like, everybody's just about to be high, just, you know, walking around, <laughs> living a life or whatever, you know, it's like, it, it is what it is. No, it didn't really affect me at this point in my life. Like, I'm married with four kids. They ain't <laughs> even on my radar. Right, right. right. <laughs> I would say, for me, so I wasn't even thinking about it from the perspective of like actually using it because I mm-hmm. don't smoke. I've never smoked. I've never even smoked a cigarette. So I really ain't trying to smoke no weed. I'm scared my lungs will like collapse or burn <laughs> up or something. I just I've never been interested in it. But what did catch my attention around it was like the political aspect of it and the legal aspect of it. Just thinking about how laws were created, you know, to lock up so many brown people, specifically mm-hmm. like black men, and just the number of black men who are in jail today because of. <clears throat> simply marijuana and now you have all these people you know particularly white people who are making millions of dollars off of something that a lot of black people are in jail for so I was kind of happy about it being legalized not from the perspective of it being available to people to use recreationally but just from the hope that um, the laws would no longer be targeting black people for possession so I was hoping it would just be more or less pure less black people in jail Thanks. for weed. Right. Um, but before we get too deep into the weed discussion, let's talk about alcohol. Um, because the Bible clearly talks about the consumption of alcohol, but it doesn't really talk about the use of weed. So let's get into a little bit about um, just from the perspective of Christians and alcohol. So does the Bible forbid Christians to drink? You're right, it doesn't. Uh, (laughs) I mean, everybody always just talks about how Jesus' first miracle was what? Turning water water into into wine, wine, right? Good wine. They was getting lit. (laughs) And and, and then to think about it too, like, but it makes me want to just learn the history of it too because Mm -hmm. they had run out of wine at this point in the wedding. So that means they had been drinking already. Mm -hmm. And so for Jesus to turn the water into wine, like to keep the party going, it just made me think, was their wine like the same strength, you know, right. you know, were people able to get drunk off, it, off right. of it? Because I feel like God would not, you know, continue to produce alcohol if like people was just getting wild and sloppy drunk and stuff like that. Correct. So I know we always use that, but I just, that's just me thinking. I don't know the answer to that question, but that was just something I was thinking about. But you're right. The Bible doesn't say um, you can't drink. That's what they did. That was part of the custom. But it does offer a lot of warnings and dangers of drinking alcohol. And it even just says, don't get drunk, right, which is right. the difference, right? right. But just from what you've learned in your Christian walk, like what have you learned about like being a Christian and drinking alcohol? Well, I would say I had to learn how to uh, set boundaries. And then eventually, um, when I started setting boundaries, God told me to set boundaries. And eventually, he led me to not drink because of those actual boundaries. Um, me setting boundaries showed me how to be dis- disciplined in my drinking, because I basically went from, you know, having fun with it to limiting my actual drinking. Mm-hmm. And then, when, of course, when me and you got, when we had children, God was like, okay, your limitation has to be zero, mm-hmm. basically. Um, so those are the choices he gave me. So setting boundaries, I think, helps with responsibility, accountability, and ownership to Christ versus you out here getting drunk because if you don't have no boundaries eventually those that one drink would turn into a multiple right mm-hmm. right I agree with uh, what Courtney said but also I had to switch up who I was hanging around with you know what I'm saying like when I was in college you know I was drinking to have fun and partying and doing all that crazy stuff but once I came back to St. Louis you know I wasn't hanging around the same environment or whatever and to be 100% honest, I never was like a huge drinker to begin with because alcoholism runs in my family, you know. So that just kind of turned me off to begin with anyway, just seeing different family members, you know, addicted to this substance. Um, so once I became of age to drink, 
you know, I'm I'm a one and done type of girl. Like one drink, I'm good. Like I don't need to have a drink to have fun because I'm already on a natural high of life. I don't need an extra high on top of that. You know what I'm saying? So, and then on top of that, I don't tr- really trust people in a social environment. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, drinking and stuff, I want to be coherent about what's going on in my surroundings. And if I'm drinking and stuff like that, nah, big dog. Like, it, <laughs> absolutely not. So, for me, like I said, I had to change my environment. Um, but I don't get enjoyment of, of being drunk. You yeah. know, I don't have enjoyment of not knowing what my body is doing and not knowing my surroundings and stuff like that. It is super that's scary to me, especially as a woman. It, it's right. very scary. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't, yeah. Uh, my testimony is pretty much the same as far as uh, having family members uh, that were, like, that's what they did. They social drank, and then they went from, oh, social drinking to, okay, it's Tuesday, 6 o'clock in the morning. What are we doing? Mm-hmm. Um, and then so when I became, I'm um, if I'm honest, I was like 16, 17, and we were like growing up super fast. And I was like, dog, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want this to be my life as well. Um, and ironically, uh, I remember uh, I was, I got, had just got off, got home from work and had bought two tall cans of Budweiser, uh, Bud Light Lime, I think it was. And I was drinking it. And then I just felt numb. And I was like, dog no, what are you doing? And you know what I'm saying? And it was like, after that, I stayed away from it, I think, up until I got married. Mm-hmm. It was like, when me and my wife was dating, it was like, okay, I had a drink, and I was like, nope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, I'm not doing this, because yeah. I felt it coming. Mm-hmm. But ironically, that, that same day, God convicted me as well as far as smoking. And uh, I was in a relationship at the time prior to my wife, and her nephews was over and I started chasing them and I was like, bro, why can't I breathe? I'm 22. <laughs> like, why can't I not breathe? And at that time I was just smoking cigarettes and I was trying to quit, but that day really made me go, bro, like you're 22. There's no mm-hmm. way you should be exhausted chasing a toddler. Yeah, like at right. no point. And you ain't have kids yet. No, nah, not at all. <laughs> and yeah, it just, it really caught my attention because like I said, at the same time we were smoking weed. And it was, for me, it was very much so recreational and uh, just who I was around. Right. And uh, I like for my, my uh, stepdad, who just passed away recently, it was how he coped with life. It was mm-hmm. a coping mechanism for him. And it was, uh, he affectionately called it his medicine. Mm-hmm. And, and you could tell the difference when he wasn't using it yeah. and when he was, or when he didn't get to, I guess, get up and smoke. Like his day just didn't get started the right way in his eyes, and it was just like, man, like I don't, I don't want to be a part of the of this generation that being our stronghold. So <laughs> it was, it was most definitely that day. I distinctly remember chasing him and going, "Wait a minute, now. <laughs> like, <laughs> why my lungs?" It's right, like, like you said, my lungs was on fire, and I'm like, "Dude, this is no." So this is not it, yeah. right? And I mean, I have the same testimony. Alcoholism runs in my family as well. And so I grew up, um, and I hope my dad doesn't mind me sharing, but like he was a functioning alcoholic. And so he would drink, he would have a beer can sitting next to the bed and wake up in the morning and just drink out that same beer can. And like he would go through so much beer throughout the day. And like I've seen him wreck so many cars driving drunk. And I just praise God that clearly God had his hand on him. Absolutely. You know, that he's still alive today to even tell his testimony testimony you know to be alive to do that um but like once I saw that I was like I don't I don't want that for myself and so I had never like beer is disgusting to me so I'd never been a beer drinker um but of course when I got to college you know start partying you know start getting that hard liquor um I actually and I don't even know why I don't remember why but I got to the point where I would have a bottle of Malibu rum in my bedroom like and that would every day I was drinking and it got to the point where my friends was like Tanisha I think we need to talk (laughs) and I didn't even realize I had gotten to that point because honestly I wasn't like getting drunk to where like I was throwing up all the time but it was just something that I felt like I needed every day Mm -hmm. um and then I think what really got me to stop drinking um was it was one night i me and my friends, we went out to the club, you know, we were drinking, and I was driving that night, and I had no rec- recollection of how we got home. Wow. 
all I remember is the next morning the oven was on, it was burnt pizza on the stove, and I was just like, I could have died. I could have killed my friends. I could have killed somebody I didn't even know because I, I literally could not remember. And I'm like, no, this is not it. Mm -hmm. And so from there, like, I don't drink hard liquor to this day. I might have a glass of wine, like, if I go out. Yeah. But it's um, a single glass if I'm mm -hmm. able to make it through that. Um, but it really is, like, when you think about what the Bible says about alcohol, <laughs> like, I think we have all probably seen it in our lives. Um, and so, like, it says, like, Hosea... 411 wine and new wine take away their understanding um, Ephesians 518 and do not get drunk on wine in which lies debauchery and you think about like okay this is crazy so we watch the girls gone wild documentary mm. don't judge us mm. but when you, <laughs> <laughs> when you think about it though like that's how they made their Thanks. money all these girls yeah. were drunk yep. like yep. just yep. drunk and in which lies debauchery because that's literally mm -hmm. all it was but it's telling us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I thank God for his grace because I think all of us can be very thankful that we're still here today yep. to tell the story and to give the testimony yeah. because there are some people who did not get to live yeah. and some people who have innocently died never even took a drink but were killed by a drunk driver. And so I think we have to be very careful. Um, and so now that we're all mature in our walk and we might still have a glass of wine occasionally or we might have a drink socially for those that do choose to do so do you all think that drinking hurts your witness mm -hmm. I, I think, think you gotta know your audience yeah mm -hmm. cause yeah, like that. for a new believer I think that would be like wait what you doing bro what you doing yeah. but for somebody who's again matured and they'd be like it probably wouldn't even phase them in the first place unless that was something they were struggling with mm -hmm. so try not to be a stumbling block that's right yeah yeah. Uh, yeah I definitely agree with that know your audience and then yeah that's a very key word and um, you know we always have to be we don't have to be on we have to be prime example that's what kind of right. what God was showing me a little bit because knowing your audience you want to be a prime example because you don't want to lead somebody else astray because you taking one drink and you know who that is, whatever, wherever, wherever your surroundings you go. You take one sip, that may lead somebody astray. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't want to mislead anybody because of your actual judgment. So yeah, knowing your audience and then being a prime example, I would say. Yeah, and I think the Bible talks about that too. It says, like Paul says, like if you drinking is going to cause your brother to fall, yeah. or you eating something is going to cause your brother to fall, then you shouldn't do it. Yeah. And I think the issue, it becomes an issue when we feel like well, I can do it anyway, yeah. but then I feel then that thing has become an idol. So if you feel like you just have to have this drink and even thinking about causing somebody to stumble doesn't stop you from drinking, then I think it may be an issue. But I always think about too, like, so we're married and we have children now. And so let's say we're out, you know, and we are out and we're, if we were out drinking and whoever has our kids, they call us and say, so-and-so fell and now that we need to take them to the hospital. I don't want to be trying to figure out how to yeah. get to the hospital and I'm inebriated or anything like that. Mm -hmm. My parents, like, I thank God that they're still alive and they're still young, you know, in their 60s. But I would hate for anything to happen to them and somebody calls me and, and I've been drinking and now I don't even have a clear head to be mm -hmm. able to go and help my, my parents. And then, like, with us being in leadership, you know, we get calls like somebody might need counseling, you know, they need help with something. What we look like <laughs> trying to go <laughs> preach to <Right>. somebody. <laughs> and y'all drunk. You know, yep. uh, even, yeah. And so it, I think it can hurt your witness. And so you do have to be careful and to know that um, it's something that we have to be able to put down. And if it has control over you, then it might be something that needs to be addressed. Right. And so we've kind of talked about alcohol where and the Bible specifically mentions wine, it specifically mentions beer, it specifically mentions being drunk. But now we have this marijuana where it's not mentioned in the Bible. And so is it forbidden? Should is it okay for Christians to do it? Um because I know it's probably Christians that do it, but the Bible doesn't say you can't. So what do you all think about that? Um I think when you smoke weed are you sober? That's a good way to put it. You know, when you drink and you're drunk, are you sober? Mm -hmm. You are not. Um, 
So for me, when you are smoking marijuana, um, the effects of it take over your mental capacity, takes over possibly bodily functions and all of that good jazzy stuff, and you're not in your right frame of mind when you are smoking weed. Um, so that that is my question for people who are Christians and, and think that it is okay. Are you sober when you're smoking? Yeah, that's a real good way to put it. Yep. I uh, recently saw this article online, um, and we all have just talked about how we saw alcoholism run in our family. Mm -hmm. And so this, there was a study that was done, and it says that now millennials and Gen Z are moving away from alcohol. And so the article was a little misleading because it had you think that, you know, we just we just don't drink because our you know we saw the effect it had on our parents right. but really all that has happened is that millennials and gen z have really just moved Replace to marijuana it. and so right. they've replaced it they may not be smoking it but they're chewing it they're eating mm -hmm. it you know it's in edibles and stuff like that um and then um there's an article from kcr.org that came out in march and it just gave an update on one month marijuana sales mm -hmm. in missouri there was $72 million in recreational weed sales in one month. Wow. In Illinois, they had $39 million in the same month. What's crazy about it is that Illinois has doubled the population of Missouri, but half the sales. And so I guess it just has us thinking, so why are, why are so many people moving to marijuana? What do you think are the reasons that people smoke? And if you have smoked, what were some of the reasons that you did? I only did it for recreation, just to go have fun, because mm -hmm. I was still working out, I was still doing what I wanted to do, but I noticed uh, several changes, like when I was doing it too much, and then I would notice I would get extremely lazy and extremely um, hungry. So it would consume my mind a little bit. <laughs> the munchies. The munchies. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would either, I'll be extreme, I'll be a couch potato. We wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything. That's how it made, it, it made me feel extremely lazy. And then it may help me make bad choices. I've gotten fired for making wrong decisions because I was kind of high prior to going to my job. I made a horrible decision that kind of, you know, ruined my job. And it, mm -hmm. I felt bad because it, it was a job that my dad had, you know, you know helped me get. And I got fired because I, I I threw somebody into some glasses. Lord, Courtney. Um, yeah, he came at me in the wrong way, and I was like, bro, <laughs> don't do this right now. <laughs> so yeah, we don't need I was kind of responding influence. and reacting, so it kind of helped slow my actual thought process down, and I ended up get, um, put, putting myself in harmful situations or wrong decision-making, and it made me extremely lazy. Uh, two, people use it for anxiety and depression. It seems like it helps as a relief. It's a stress relief, yeah. um, and I've been kind of noticing that a little bit, so mm -hmm. For a younger, gen a younger generation, I've seen them talk about that all the time on YouTube. Uh, they may be stressed out when they don't have to be stressed out. You never know their circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to actually pray for those type of things. We don't want those younger generations to be stressed out, and they're too young for that. Yeah. And I do want to clarify. So we're only talking about recreational use. Like we're, right. So if like somebody like has cancer and their doctor has prescribed it for them, we are not talking about that today. We're just talking about people who do it recreationally outside of um, – medical care mm -hmm. so I think um, for me in my previous life yes I did um, smoke weed I was in college and that was the it thing to do you know if I'm not in class uh, me and my friends you want to smoke you got five dollars <laughs> <laughs> you trying to match you know what I'm saying right. like that was just the it thing to do but you know in and, and high school and, and stuff like that like I didn't I didn't really do it like that because, well, for one, I don't know how to roll. I don't know how to do none of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, that ain't me. It wasn't your gift. It wasn't, it wasn't my gift, you know. But if it was around me, yeah, I may dibble and dabble into it. But once I really got off to college and on my own, my mama and daddy not, not here, um, that's when I participated more. And like I said, it was, it was a lifestyle because I was in that environment or whatever. But... Now I can't even I can't stand the smell. Like I don't want to smell like it. I don't want to be around it. If I'm at a a function or something like that, and somebody is smoking, all right, Paige is gone. I catch y'all on the flip side. 
you know. But I think the reason why it's so it's so popular now because it's it's the it things to do. You know, probably like back in the day when cigarettes was a thing, when our grandparents yeah. and stuff like that, cigarettes That's was the it thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I think it's just with the times that it is right now, it's just the it thing to do. And especially because it has became legalized, you can get it at the tip of your hand now. Mm-hmm. You know, Courtney was just talking about the dispensary that's down the street from the church. You know, when I leave church on Sundays, that line be wrapped around there. Mm-hmm. I said, "How come y'all don't come up the street to church <laughs> and come to the and come to church like that?" You know, if if you had the same fire to go get some weed to go to church, but you know, mm-hmm. I, like I said, it's just the it things to do now, and and probably uh, some years from now is gonna be something different, and years from that is gonna be something different. You know, it's just we just with the times. That's what it is. Man, uh, <laughs> uh, my experience was most definitely recreational because it was a part of the lifestyle of, all right, we finna go kick it. Like, what club we going to? Right. Somebody was putting something in rotation. <laughs> um, but I can tell you this. I do remember being younger and the smell of what the adults were doing at that time versus what I started doing it. It's totally different. It's not the same. Not the same. This is hybrid. (laughs) I don't think this was never supposed to be inhaled at no point. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can just see how we're we're our generation of millennials. I can say we're choosing to cope with things differently. Like even though we are trying to get more uh, in tune with with our emotions, more so than our parents were. it also came with the, oh, I'm gonna just go smoke. I'm gonna just deal with it that way. And um, I don't, I, I can't say that it's helped, but I, I don't know. Like I, I have friends now. Like I can definitely. They were hot heads when we were younger. They're not so much hot heads now. So it's like, yeah, well, at least you ain't getting locked up. You know what I mean? Right, so right. you ain't getting in this fight that would have been a fight ten years ago, ten, fifteen years ago. So, I mean. I don't know. I, I, my thing is, is like I said, God was like, "Hey, that ain't for you," mm-hmm. and I was like, "You right." <laughs> it ain't. Yeah, right. I mean, I so I've never done it, but I can see, like, if it if it does relax you or if it does like lessen stress and anxiety, I can see why so many people have run to it because the world is stressful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you just look at it like you can't even. And so you got social media now, which you can't go on there and not see something that's not going to stress you out right, either. Right, you right. know, it's a, something racist happening somewhere. Man. Some new law is being passed that's going to impact you in a negative way. Prices are going up. You want to get married and you're still single. You know, it's like it's just so many things. Life is lifing mm-hmm. for a lot of people. And so, Paige, you were asking, like, well, why are they going to the cookies line? Or to the dispensary line, Mm -hmm. you know, and not coming to church. But it's because, like, I feel like they're looking for something, and they just don't realize. Trying to find peace. Yeah. And and that's, like, the the pseudo-cheap version Mm -hmm. of what actual peace is. Well, come down the street to (laughs) Westside. PC and AP going to get you right. Right. (laughs) Almost like the living water. So when you had the Mm -hmm. woman at the well, and Jesus Mm -hmm. like, why are you asking for this water, and you just going to come back and be thirsty again? And I just see Jesus saying the same thing to people who may, Ooh, you know, be stuck with this marijuana. Why are you going back to this thing that's not going to satisfy you? Mm-hmm. You're going to, the high is going to wear off. When you come back down, life is still going to be life in. Right. But if you come Big to time. me, you <laughs> get a new life and you <laughs> get everlasting life. And I think people are just trying the wrong thing. Talk and so I it. think we're, we've gotten to the point where, we want to judge people yep. for doing it and condemn people for doing it instead of really getting to the bottom of, well, why are mm-hmm. you doing yeah. it? Right. Yes. You know, and some people that might be all they know, mm-hmm. you know, Antoine, you talked about that's what people around me, that's what they yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe if they was inviting me to Bible study, inviting me to youth group, <laughs> maybe it would, you know, it might be a little bit different. Thanks. Mm-hmm. And so I think, Oh, and I, uh, I hate to not mention it. It's in our music, though. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, it yeah. Is, oh, yeah. If I'm honest, it went from, uh, I think I think it was either J. Cole or Kendrick Lamar that said it. You went, we went from being the drug dealers to the drug users. And you see it in especially the younger millennials and the, mm-hmm. uh, the Zers. Like, you can see it. Like, it, it just, they... 
it's all around it's, him. Yeah, it's just like it's. I just feel the mercy of God on them because it's like y'all he chasing the wrong things mm-hmm. again. Yeah. Like this ain't it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think about too how it's easier now. So oh, yes. you don't have to smoke it. <laughs> I can't. Sure don't, I love gummy bears. I love gummy worms. I but I'm still not gonna try no edible. Yeah. Right. But I'm just uh-huh. saying that to say like if I was taking marijuana, you don't you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't smell it on me yeah. because I didn't smoke it. Yeah. I just ate it. And so now I can do it and I don't even have the stigma of, you know, doing you know. And so I think that helps because it allows people to hide and do it. But yeah. I think Jesus is just asking y'all, just saying, come to me, yeah. you who yeah. are heavy laden, you know, you stressed out, come to me. Mm-hmm. And I think um, we should just encourage people to just question, well, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, why do I feel like I need this? Am I addicted to it? You know, um, so I, I'm of the belief that it's not what God wants for us. Antoine, he specifically told you that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he thinks the same thing for all of us. I don't think that's what he wants for us. He wants us to know peace. Mm-hmm. He wants us to not be anxious for anything. And the answer is not in marijuana. The answer is not in alcohol. The answer is in him. Mm-hmm. And so to those out there who are struggling and you need somebody to walk along with you, we will link all our contacts and information. Reach out ask questions you know we're not we're not here to condemn we're here to help we're here to offer hope um and so with that does anybody have any other final thoughts on the topic any encouragement anything that helped you to overcome when you decided to just make the change um if i'm gonna just be completely transparent even more um this was not like a overnight oh god said don't do it and i was like all right no i like literally i think i was 24, 25, I'm 33 now, and I can't say within the last five years I haven't, And because uh, even when CBD became a thing, I tried it just to be like, oh, I could do this, and I was like, it's the same feeling, like, I don't want to, you know what I mean, like, and uh, it's just amazing how many times they try to, oh, I'm going to take this out so you can do this, the edibles and things of that nature, and it's just like, um, for me, again, I just want to be a uh, a witness and a standard for what God has called us to and I just like like even now I just keep hearing be of sober mind yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. yeah. um, I think that if you do smoke marijuana you're not a terrible person God does Thanks. not hate you um, for smoking weed or, or drinking alcohol um, if you if you do need help um, try to change the environment that you are in change the people that you are hanging around be around like-minded people that want help and don't want to you know smoke weed or or be drunk um and all of that um you can do it it's this is not too hard for god he deals with individuals who struggle with this on a day-to-day basis every day so just run to him and, and lay it all out there and say lord like i'm struggling with this i'm struggling with getting high every day I'm struggling getting drunk every single day or whatever the case might be or whatever capacity that that might be and and he will help you this is not too hard and you have four individuals right here who all have a testimony who all have went through something probably similar like that and we all have overcame it so that's my encouragement to people out there preach page okay come on bishop (laughs) (laughs) Yes, right. Courtney. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> All right. Well, I, was, I just wanted to say that um, God was telling me to, to remind you guys that you know, he wants us to unveil the mask. He doesn't want to just continue to keep hiding behind uh, mm-hmm. our masks because sometimes we use those things to, uh, to hide uh, behind a mask. Um, so uh, just continue to ask, actually, one, pray, and then ask God for people, ask him to send people to you that will help you um, go another route because it's not easy. You can't actually do this alone by yourself because if you're, if it's something that you do every day, um, then you, it's a struggle. Then you need to reach out to other people. So pray and ask God to send you those people who can help you and lead you to do other things if they're not a part of your family. So if your family struggles with it too, pray for them as well. But you want to keep them in prayer because you can't 
do this alone. So God wants us to unveil the mask so we could um, no longer hide behind our actual struggles. He wants your struggle and your sin, so kind of reveal that to him, and he can kind of lead you out of those struggles. Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. Period. Won't you come? (laughs) (laughs) But I do think that this is a good time to pray. So does anybody feel led? I will definitely feel led. Come on Uh, now. uh, Let's go to God. Um, God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be a witness to uh, a new generation, oh God. And God, you have set us aside to be standard bearers. Let us be that and for your glory, oh God. Um, and as we pray for these and we stand in the gap for those who are struggling with marijuana and alcoholism, um, even depression, just trying to cope with life, dear God, we just give them to you because they may not know how to approach you, dear God. We ask that you pour your peace upon them, oh God, that they see that that you are a merciful God and not an angry God. You are a loving God, a God that wants his people to come unto him, oh God. Yes. Um, we, we, we just give you honor and praise for these things, oh God, because without the sacrifice that your son made, we would not be worthy, but because you are a God of understanding infinitely, yeah. dear God, you gave us the opportunity to choose your son, dear God, and we give you glory and honor, and we love you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 If you enjoyed this episode, and if you would like to help support the podcast, please subscribe and leave a rate and a review. For our YouTube listeners, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. To stay up to date with This Ain't Sunday Morning and to get all the behind the scenes content, you can follow us on Instagram at WS period YAM on Facebook at Westside Young Dash Adults and on TikTok at WSYAM.STL. You can also send your thoughts or questions directly to us to our email, youngadults at westsidenbc.org. Also, if you send us a screenshot of your like, subscription, or follow, you will be entered into a raffle to win some This Ain't Sunday Morning merch. Thanks for watching.